hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Daniel Summerfield. I'm a consultant with ThoughtWorks. And if you haven't heard of ThoughtWorks, we're a IT consulting company of about 3,000 people. And this was a little controversial today. 30 offices in 12 countries or something like that. That's, we're, we're negotiating. Yeah, we're Some, somewhere around there. Um, you'll, hear, you'll hear about us mostly in connection with things like DevOps, with continuous delivery, all things lean and agile and all that. That's sort of our, our, uh, our uh, specialization, such as it is. Um, but what we care most about is our customers, or our customers' customers. And um, we believe that since the customer is paramount, security should be no exception to that. And, and, and so what we're going to talk about today is how to structure your work and your processes to best serve the needs of your customers. And um, so I call this a, an irreverent look. And am I going to be, oh, I can, OK, I can go to about here. I just felt cloistered back there. So I call this irreverent look because security is this kind of huge, sometimes very somber topic. And we have to have room for a little bit of fun. So I inject a little bit of fun, just a little, I promise, into this. And, um, but don't worry, there's some gloom and doom too. That will, that will, be, that will be there as well. Um, many of the ideas I'm going to be presenting are not my own. Some of them are sort of culled from conventional wisdom. And I think that's important because there is a lot of conventional wisdom out there. And this is, I pick and choose from the stuff that I think is the most relevant from my experience. In addition, some of these ideas are my own. And I will warn you, some of them are early days thinking. Um, and I will try to do my best to tell you which those are, uh, the ones that are not fully baked, so to speak. So my biggest hope is that, is that you, the developers and managers of de developers, et cetera, start looking for these patterns for yourself. I'm just presenting you a way of thinking about this. And I, I, I would love if you would come up to me and tell me all the places I got this completely wrong after. I'm, I'm, my ego can take it. But if you are thinking critically about these issues, then I have succeeded. And, and uh, because application security is really, really important, and we are just still not very good at it. So um, I imagine I don't have to spend a great deal of time convincing you that security matters. You're here, you're in this business, uh, and unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, you, probably these logos mean something to you. They ring a bell somehow. But it's worth driving the point home anyway, for those who haven't bought it yet. <laughs> this stuff matters a lot. And um, so d I actually don't wear a tinfoil hat, at least not in public. But I am one of those people, insofar as I believe things are going to get very, very bad very, very soon before they ultimately get better. And we're the people who are going to make it better. But I think we're, we haven't hit bottom yet in this space. There's a lot, you're going to be seeing those logos or additional logos a lot more in the future. Um, some organizations are more desirable as targets than others. But if you have CPU cycles, if you have network resources, then you are, at least on some level, a target for attack. So I talked a little bit about why it's important. Now I want to talk about what we're trying to do is hard. Because don't get me wrong, it is hard. Writing secure applications, secure web applications, is not easy. And um, when I started in this business, which was just about 20 years ago, hackers were hoodlums, were hobbyists, were kids with computers, and oh, what, 200 baud modems, whatever. And that has changed. These people are professionalized. They are, um, they are organized crime. They are foreign governments. They are not so foreign governments. They are, so the game has changed. And to make that even more complicated, the software we're writing today is more complicated not only than the software used to be, but I would argue it's more complicated than anything humanity has ever devised up to now. I mean, if you think about the layers and layers and layers. And so that, it's hard to know even where to start a lot of the time. And we are just going to scratch the surface of that. The business. You're going to hear me talk about the business a lot, this amorphous capitalized entity called the business. Another challenge is they're not interested in this for the most part. They're interested in their core business 
as it should be. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed. One of the things we're going to have to do is know how to have the conversations to bring business into the fold so they're thinking about these things too because they have a stake and they have choices to make. And then finally, this is the one I'm, I'm going to at least focus on considerably, if not the most, is the technologies we use were not built for what we use them for. They were not built with security in mind. And so we have to do a lot of backflips to make it work. So that said, did that work? We need ways to try to make it easier for ourselves, because right now it is too hard. And I'm going to propose a few of those ways. And I'm going to do so by talking about two pairs of pattern and anti-pattern. I mean, you the pairs, uh, patterns often go in pairs, you probably notice. There's, here's what not to do, here's what to do. That's gross oversimplification, but it's, it's the, in the right idea. And I, I also want to warn you, I'm playing a little fast and loose with the term pattern, but I feel okay about that because pattern has always been a little bit of a fast and loose term. So think of patterns as, um, I don't want to use the word template. I use the word template when I road tested this and got my wrist slapped. But um, it's, it's a, a way of thinking out a problem and a proposed solution or at least a, a proposed way to approach the problem. So the first one of these, we're going to talk a little bit about context. I like the word context a lot when I'm talking about security. Because uh, in the bad old days of, of non-memory protected languages, the blurry line between executable code on one hand and application data caused us a lot of headaches. Still does, one would argue. Um, but while these buffer overflows are not, or underflows, are not a thing of the past by any means, they're less common than when we all programmed in C. And so memory management makes our job a whole lot harder. If you're programming in Python, if you're programming in Java, etc., you're generally not focusing or don't really need to focus quite as much on bu buffer overflows. However, we've created this world. Can, I, I hope you can see this back there. It's a little washed out. They're having some sort. Apparently, we're missing our reds or something like that. But what are we looking at here? Um, some of you in the back, just a blur. But if you can see this, the question is, is this a JSP page? Is it an HTML page? Is it a JavaScript page? Where am I going to run into trouble? How do I encode this untrusted content here? So generally speaking, what we want to avoid is complexity when we're talking about patterns for secure software. This is not avoiding complexity. We want patterns that help us so, so we can see the forest for the trees, or a better more metaphor might be see the individual trees within the forest. And this doesn't, isn't to say these are going to be patterns to guarantee secure code. That's basically impossible. Rather, we're going to talk about ways to structure our applications and then ultimately our organizations in a way that makes it easier for you to write secure code. And that the good news about this, which is fleeting and limited, is that a lot of these patterns are familiar patterns. A lot of them are patterns that are a good idea for other reasons. And this is not a coincidence. It's We get into trouble when we write code that is hard to understand, code that is hard to change, and code whose behavior is hard, to, if not impossible, to predict. So to visualize, this is my favorite that we have here. This is, this is system X. So I, I showed this to my wife, who's very, very smart. And I'm not just saying that because I'm being filmed. And she's somewhat technical. She is not a programmer, however. And I showed her this diagram and said, do you think it would be harder to secure this or this? <laughs> And she said, well, of course, the second one would be easier to secure. And she's right, I would argue. Um, I bet you agree with me. Uh, if, if we agree that simplicity is desirable, then let's talk about how to encourage behaviors that creates uh, simplicity. That means practicing familiar things like separation of concerns, both on architectural level and in code level, um, writing clear self-documenting APIs, and helping the clients of those APIs do the right thing and the safe thing. Um, practicing positive modeling. This is another one of the words I love. I love the notion of positive modeling, and one of the patterns will reflect that. So pattern, anti-pattern number one is the Russian doll. 
Um, I've named all these myself. I, well, except for, well, with one caveat. I'll talk about that one later. But so if you take issue with my naming, I have no one else to blame. So nested context, entangled concerns. This is the Russian doll anti-pattern. And um, it occurs because markup language is a very funny thing, like in that, that little snippet I showed you before. It's a very fine line between one context and another. One slip of an angle bracket, one runaway quote, and you're in a whole world of hurt. So that makes this very, very risky. Oh yeah, we really are washed out on our reds. Anyway, this is not unlike the first one I showed you, but JavaScript DL, a URL, HTML attribute, JavaScript and HTML. It's even debatable what is containing what, I would argue. And um, I, I would point you to OWASP. To they talk in great detail about output encoding. This is an output encoding nightmare. So, so why do I call this an anti-pattern? Most applications, there's going to be some untrusted data, some, tr some data crossing a trust boundary. Let's put it that way. And as good... Good, good citizens and good dues-paying members of OWASP, we know that we can't just barf that data out onto the page. We have to encode it. And, and we're not going to talk a whole lot about encoding here. You could do a whole long half-day session on encoding because it's fairly complicated. But in the case of entry ID, for those of you, that's entry ID, entry.id. What risks do we need to be concerned with here? And is there any chance we're going to going to end up with code evaluating within that context. And what context is that? Well, we've got a URL context that we can break out of. We've got JavaScript context. We've got the tag, HTML context, et cetera. So to be clear, the answer in this, the case of this imaginary app may be it's all fine. It, may, it might be. But wouldn't it be better if we minimized the possibility of it not being fine? and limit the possibilities of making a mistake in the first place, because we will make mistakes. Because you don't want to have, whoop, did I get, I didn't get it, there it is. You don't want to have this conversation with your manager, nor do you want to have this conversation with the AppSec team. And this is all too often the conversations we have, and all too often the AppSec team just kind of shrugs their shoulders because there's not a whole lot we, they can do about it. So I have an alternate to propose, or let me, one alternate to propose, the McDLT pattern. I can tell by the chuckles that at least some of you are older than 30. So the McDLT, who hasn't heard of the McDLT? And don't be shy, okay. So the McDLT, to give a very short McDonald's history lesson, the McDLT was this environmental nightmare that McDonald's created in the 80s when I was of the age. It didn't actually have HTML, JavaScript, and template logic in it, but it had a bun and a burger in about eight square feet of styrofoam. And the idea was to keep the hot side hot and the cool side cool. It was, it was marketing genius, and it, it, thankfully they don't do it anymore. But So I do need to rename this because I need some help. Um, I, I think it does a good job articulating Separation of concerns. It's, it's a little catchy. It's memorable. Problem is twofold. I might get sued. And secondly, that um, <laughs> a third of the audience has no idea what I'm referring to. So if you have a better name for this, I'm, I'm all ears. So what is the McDLT pattern? So as, as, as implied, HTML, JavaScript, and template logic. It looks something like this. The McDLT pattern. Markup should have no embedded JavaScript or CSS. In other words, nice side benefit of that, you can turn on content security policy. And um, for those of you, I'm not going to go into content security policy either. So if you want to talk about that, we can talk afterward. Really interesting stuff. Um, markup should have no embedded server-side templates, if possible. And if you absolutely need to embed it, make sure it's, in, it's very specific. It's not kind of scattered throughout your code. That means PHP, JSP, uh, ASP, and all the other SPs. Um, nested context is therefore minimized, probably not eliminated. It's inevitable in a markup world we're going to have nested context. And if you model, if you modify the DOM, which I can't imagine an app anymore that doesn't, you do so through DOM manipulation methods, not through taking a big string, monkeying with it, 
cramming some untrusted data in it and turning it into part of your DOM tree and shoving that in the DOM because that is a, the path to a very bad place. In addition, the McDLT pattern <coughs> communicates strictly by AJAX. There's some, there's some advantages to that. And that the, the service you're communicating with um, is single origin. In other words, you're either not using cores at all you're, or you're, um, you've restricted to a single or a very small set of allowable endpoints that the JavaScript is willing to communicate. If you want to see what that looks like, if you want to see a start to what that would look like, sort of, I'm trying to do a canonical McDLT app on my GitHub page. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite done, I have to admit. But feel free to look. It, it shows the structure. And um, so what do we get for that? Well, because our con it's a lot harder to mix contexts if you're in separate files. And I, I didn't call this out explicitly, and I probably should, that mixing context is, the, is where XSS attacks come into play. And um, if these are in separate files, that becomes much, much harder. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I, I hate to use the word impossible, because every time I say impossible, I'm proved wrong like minutes later. So your CSS is only going to have CSS in it. Your, JavaScript is only going to have JavaScript in it, et cetera. Um, again, we've been pushed in this direction in recent years for, for architectural reasons, so not too unique, but, and that's a good thing. Um, you, but if you avoid all the inline JSS and CSS, you, you're, you're going to get close to context separation. So out of, another aspect of this on the server side, out of the box, AJAX will, will only interact with the, uh, an endpoint that's from the same origin that it comes from. And you should use that. It's one of the great things about AJAX. And um, unless you're using JSONP, don't use JSONP. If you haven't heard of JSONP, look it up and then never use it. Unless you're doing something totally public, don't use it. It's, it's a terrible idea. It's a hack to start with and a lot of bad things come from it. So to be absolutely clear, this strategy of, um, of basically using point of origin as a way of protecting your application will not prevent somebody from hitting your service. This is not a strategy for protecting your service. For that, you need authentication, you need whatever the, the, app, the, the app requires. This is not gonna protect your service, it's gonna protect your user. Somebody can still curl your service, but assuming your user is using a, a valid user agent, this will prevent um, side channel CSRF attacks. There's another acronym for you. Oh, I knew that was gonna happen. I'm not sure why it seems to always occur. Thanks. And they're back. Okay. So that's the McDLT. Next pattern of note, which is a less about complexity than about imprecision. Um, sometimes it's not about the code you write specifically, it's about how you write it, and even the order you write it in, ultimately affecting the code you write. And so, so often we write functional code and deploy functional code, and then we layer security on top of it. And, um, or we, we put up a fully functional app and then block the bits we think aren't safe. And that brings us to our next anti-pattern, the whack-a-mole pattern or locking it down, blacklisting, a lot of names. Now, um, this is a hugely applicable idea. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive a little deeper and talk about a little code with this one, but it's these ideas, um, both positive and negative, manifest way more broadly. It's about how you write XSS resistant endpoints. It's about how you enable permissions on database tables. It's about file system permissions, ACL configuration, node configuration within a VPC, all this stuff. And, um, and so this is one worth thinking about. And here's what it looks like with little boxes and colors and stuff. So on, on the left, we have goodies. These are the exposed goodies on the left. And should they be exposed? The answer is maybe they should. Um, but if you start open and lock it down, basically blacklisting, the chance you miss something is considerably higher, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually sh see that in our little code exercise. If you want to see the code, if you want to download and monkey around with the code, here it is. It's, again, I 
hope you can read it. Daniel Summerfield is my Git repo, and this one's called Imprecision Patterns. So feel free. So, so what, what I do in this one is I set up a little uh, ACL-ish API. I regret in retrospect calling it an ACL because it's not really one. But in short, you can create roles. You can create principles. Principles or in, we'll call them users for the sake of argument. Um, and in addition, you can build an ACL which says, in effect, this resource requires a permission. This other, oh, and that one, that shouldn't be there. Don't worry about it. Anyway, uh, it allows you to say this requires read permission, and then your roles would be assigned read permission. Nothing magical about this. It's made up, but it's not uncommon. And then in your code, you would do a check if the principal can read, write, whatever, that resource. And it's worth noting that this is hierarchical like a file system. So if I set a permission on the top, it affects every node down unless it's subsequently overridden. So this is a really, really, really common pattern. Um, so let's say we have an application that's using this API, or one very much like it, and we get uh, some requirements. And those requirements are, okay, anonymous users can read public resources. Admin resor uh, users can read admin resources. That's all we got. It's like, okay, there's a, there's a hundred ways we can model this problem. But this is what we've been given. So we're good TDD people, right? We write our test first. Yeah, so um, at what point can't people see this? I'm just curious. I want to know how much context. You can't? I mean, I can see that there's letters there. <laughs> <laughs> good news. Oh, that's really a shame. All right, I will have to extemporize a little bit. But what we're doing here, so this is our integration test. This, inter this test asserts that it asserts exactly what our business owner gave us. It asserts that admins can access one resource and, um, and the anonymous users can only access the, blah, 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 what was I saying? The, they can't access the, the um, admin, but they can access anonymous. Super simple. And, and so, so now we have this in this app configuration class, which you'll see or not see, depending on where you're sitting. Um, imagine spring or something like that. We're going to tweak the, tweak the knobs to assign permissions to users and say, we're going to assign a permission here, permission here, just like you would in a file system. Uh, and the other knob we have is adding requirements. In other words, saying, I require read, I require write, and we're only going to deal with reading right now. So here's our out-of-the-box ACL. This just basically says everything is, everything is open. This is a vanilla ACL. Um, we don't even have to write access to, to public resources because that's implicit in this ACL. Um, going back for a second, I want to make sure I said everything I needed to say. So I, I, one thing I didn't say for you in the back, this is test anonymous access to public resources. That's our first test step. We're saying make sure that public People in the public can access public resources. And then we implemented this, and it just worked. We really had to do basically nothing. Our next step, our next permission step, was to say test admin access to admin resources. So can admin users access admin resources? We will find that just kind of works, because again, we haven't provided any kind of restrictions on our ACL. So now, um, we are going to change our implementation uh, somewhere. Where is my implementation change? So yes, here's my implementation change. I have now said, um, now, uh, sorry, got a, little, got a little off there for a second. Um, we also write a test that asserts that anonymous access is not, a, or anonymous users can't access admin resources, right? That's, that's sort of the key here. And that's what we haven't yet implemented. So we write that test. We implement it in our ACL. So all this says, for those of you way back, is resource admin requires permission for read. So we've now restricted it. We run our tests again. They're all basically broken because neither admin nor anonymous has any access to anything. Actually, I think one, will one that was failing passes and one that was passing fails. So 
we add a read permission to our admin user. And now anonymous uh, users have no permissions, admin users have read permission to that resource, you're done. Everything passes, you are a superstar and you're promoted. Until this happens, you get a new requirement and your business owner says, principals with user role should be able to access user resources but not admin resources. So we've got a third concern here. And so our business owner sitting right next to us and we're a little bit of a show off. Um, so we're gonna just, we're gonna rip it, we're gonna SSH onto the server and just change the code. We're not really gonna do that, but we're not gonna write a test first. We're just going to implement it because we know how this thing works. And we're gonna say the user role has access to user resources which is what the requirement stated. So why, so why, you're probably well past the point of wondering what the heck my point is. So if we then go back and write the tests and, and it, it validates everything the business owner has said is true in that those were the tests, we have one problem and that's this new requirements oops test. This is the test we didn't write. This is the test that the security team wrote figuratively, and it's because the, the, the requirement never said specifically whether an anonymous principal should have access to user resources. We talked about all the other permutations. Because we missed one permutation, and it wasn't called out explicitly in our requirements, we've made a, call it a, uh, a blacklist decision, we've made a default decision, an open decision, and if we had thought about it for two seconds, we probably would have thought, you know, really only admin should get admin, user should get user, and public should get public. We probably would have come to that. But, you know, this is a very, very simple case, and most cases are much more complicated. And the point is that it's very, very easy to miss cases on the edge. You, want the, you don't want those cases on the edge to be cases for access. Does that make sense? This is, this is blacklist approach. And this is why, if you can avoid it, you should. Um, yes, you got bad requirements and, you know, CYA and all that, because, hey, I just implement what they tell me to, but that's not helpful for the organization. So, what alternatives exist to this whack-a-mole case? There's this, and he is covered, by the way, for those of you in the back. He's got a, a fig leaf, which I think is metaphorically good, too. But this is the Michelangelo. This is opening it up. This is least privilege. You've probably heard the term least privilege before if you spend any time on the OWASP site. Um, Michelangelo believed that, a, that in every brick of marble there was a statue waiting for him to, I think he said, set the angel free was, was his expression. And we can use this as an inspiration for how we do our modeling our security. You start with a big brick of marble, that's your security posture and you start chipping away at the points that you need access. I mean, you could leave it as a big brick of marble, but then you have a useless application. So it's the chipping away rather than the building up that makes this different. And I have a cool, cool diagram for this too, kind of. It's usually redder. The goodies are still the goodies. There's controls in the way, but oh, look, hey, look at that. Okay, so when you know you need to grant access, you grant access, not before. And that's what that looks like. So, so how does the Michelangelo process work from a development point of view? Because I actually like this as an idea of when I'm in the code writing my test-driven development and all that. Um, you start with a single test. Your first test will assert that nobody has access for anything. And, and I'm gonna introduce this new idea which I'm hoping gets wildly popular and my name will be associated with it called transient unit tests. It's this idea of a unit test you or ephemeral. I like ephemeral even better. History, folks. Um, ephemeral unit test, it's the idea of a test you write knowing full well that it's not going to be there when your application is delivered. You're just asserting something early on in the process. So you write one of these ephemeral unit tests that says nobody's got access to nothing. And then you write a series of tests that slowly chip away the marble, so to speak, and um, you incrementally make changes to the code to make those tests pass. And this is just a sort of um, coding behavioral way of doing positive modeling. For example, and this one's gonna be even harder for you because I think the font's smaller, but 
If instead I have this test called test ephemeral baseline, this is testing your baseline that will never go to production. And what it says in effect is that nobody can access anything. And uh, I've created a little challenge of myself by creating this sort of structure of potentially infinite resources. So you can't, in this case, really prove no one has access to anything, but you know the app and you, can, you know the resources you care about and you can build enough confidence that no one, this is how unit testing works, right? This is how most testing works. You never have proven anything, but you have provided a pretty good idea and you've built confidence and that's what this is. So now all my public, my actually I, I'm testing from roots this time and I'm testing public and I'm testing admin and no one has access. Great. So, and my ephemeral test. Now then, so the first thing to make this pass, so I have a slight tweak on my code that's here. And all that tweak is, is saying in my ACL, the only thing that's different is zero access is the default. Everybody needs everything in order to get access to any given resource. So before we started open, now we start closed. And then we start migrating these tests one at a time. So th this is something akin, it's a little bit like, um, like refactoring in a sense, where you have these sort of ephemeral states in code that are moving on to somewhere else. The only difference is refactoring is, is functionally neutral. This is not functionally neutral. You're actually reversing the assertion. You start with a false uh, asserting that a admin a uh, resource cannot, sorry, an admin user cannot access an admin resource. Then you kill that assertion and replace it with an assertion that says an admin can access that, and then you make that pass. And slowly, slowly, very specifically, starting with uh, the most atomic and going outward, starting with the, the most um, specific and moving outward, you continue to do this. So then we've granted, this is a l idiosyncratic a little bit, uh, we can talk about my coding choices later if you want, but um, we've added the admin resource permission and opened that up. Then we migrate, we migrate the next one. I personally like to stick with a given uh, role or principle. So next I'm gonna add, glow, I'm gonna test that admin can access the other resources they need. Then I'm gonna make that pass. In this case, I have a global permission that allows that. Um, I won't go into detail about that. So then we can move on to the other users. And what we start asserting is that we have a new test here, assert that anonymous principal can access public resources. And then, again, migrate and implement. Migrate and implement. So at the end of this, we have a set of tests. Do I have an end state? I don't really have an end state. Uh, uh, I should do that. Basically, our ephemeral tests are mostly gone, or they have been replaced with positive tests, and our Hopefully, our set of permissions more accurately reflects a safer default. So if that new requirement comes along that we talked about before, and this is, this is the same slide, the user role should be act, able to access user resources, not admin resources. There's a, implicitly, the default is that anonymous users will not have access to user resources, while the default was the other way around before. And this is why positive modeling is a good idea because your defaults will be locked down rather than opened up. That's probably a lengthy way of getting to that little life lesson, but I think it's a good one. And, and ephemeral tests. I like ephemeral tests. So, yeah, and there's our user. I don't need to show you that again. Uh, the, uh, so, um, yeah, I go into too much detail there. So that's, those are the two development patterns, and again, this positive negative modeling, this can even apply as an organizational pattern. But when you are, so this is something that BSAs should care about, this is something that anybody determining requirements should, should care about, define a baseline default, and, and this idea of baseline default is gonna come up again in organizational patterns. Speaking of which, by the way, what, what time did this start? 2.30, right? Okay, just want to make sure I don't go long. I don't think I'm going to. So organizational patterns. So this is a, a little context shift. So those of you who are just 
real sort of meat under the door type programmers who don't like to talk to people can just go to sleep now. But people who, who hopefully most of you care about how organizations work. And there are simple, similar concerns in organizational patterns as code patterns. And again, I'm going to talk about two pattern anti pattern pairs. And uh, I will, I'd be lying if I wouldn't say that some of this is a little more blue sky uh, because change in organizations is hard. But I think it's no less relevant and no less important. In fact, I think in some ways it's more. So you probably, most of you have probably heard of Conway's Law by now. Conway's Law is all the rage, but it basically, in short, in case you haven't heard of it, says the software, and, and this is a terrible encapsulation of it, but it's the software written by your organization is going to look like the organization looks. So idiosyncrasies of your organization end up filtering into the code, and that's that's one of the reasons this is this is important. So. Um, Organizational structures and moral hazards make it hard for companies to build reliable IT on a reasonable budget and make it hard for the same organizations to efficiently address security risks in their system. And the kinds of patterns I'm talking about, broadly speaking, are team silos, tragedy of the commons, uh, lack of accountability, lack of reliable feedback mechanisms within their process. And you're not gonna, we're not going to solve any of those probably today. But if you can start to think about how those problems you face create the inevitable outcomes that they create and how you might be able to reform those, you'll be a step ahead. So let's talk about uh, how security matters in this context. So in my mind, security is not, should not be the sole responsibility of one person or even one team. I think it's a true cost-cutting or cross-functional concern. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a security team, although I hate that term. I think I, I recommend against calling it. It sends the wrong message. Maybe you could think in terms of security assurance. It's sort of like saying, we have a quality team. Nobody else cares about quality, just the quality team. No, it's, it's assurance. And um, you want to send the message that this is, this is cross-functional concern. And I've heard the term recently, and it just, I don't know why. It kind of gives me chills, but there's this term sec ops that's coming out of thought works right now. It just sounds strange to me, but it's sort of like DevOps for security. It's sort of tearing down the walls between those silos to mix up a metaphor a little bit. So pattern, anti-pattern number one. This, I, I didn't name this one. Um, this, is, this is the next one of our, our lunch-inspired patterns, but this one actually came from ThoughtWorks uh, in our tech radar. They, they talked about the security sandwich. So, um, this is, so phase gate security, most of you probably have dealt with an organization that works in phases and gates. Security sandwich often comes with that. And um, why is it a problem? Because it's expensive and it's high risk. And um, we'll get there, don't worry. Um, so, There it is. Okay, so what I'm trying to trying to to describe here is the situation where a company does, if we're lucky, some upfront analysis, maybe some security architecture, then develop, 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 then they throw pen testers at a problem or 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 a static analysis tool at something like that. That's the sandwich: the bread on the two sides, the meat in the middle. And again, sorry to the vegetarians. Um, that's not a security strategy. It's a pathology, and it, it, it creates expensive. Mitigation, it creates uh, vulnerabilities that are hard to detect, and it looks sort of like that. Bread, bread, meat in the middle. Not very complicated. And it, there's two variants of the security sandwich. There's the open face security sandwich, which is when you do nothing until the end, and then you run a bunch of tools and stuff, and then you throw that back at the developers. Also a very common pattern. And finally, there's the burger bowl which is nothing but development, no security concerns whatsoever. This is at least more honest, if not very effective. And so why is this a problem? Um, so there's this often quoted study out of IBM. It's, it's really amazing how often this thing's quoted, given that I cannot find the actual study. But, and if anyone has this, please <laughs> send it to me. What they, what they decided was, decided, hopefully didn't just decide, but that it costs up to 100 times more to fix a bug when it's in uh, production than when it's in architecture. So if, you, if there's, if there's some, some flaw that could have been detected by architecture, obviously you want to detect it there because it's way cheaper. 
Um, yeah, anyone who, again, if you look IBM bug study or something, you'll find people pointing to it all over the place, but I can't actually find the study. Regardless, I think we all know that it's cheaper to fix things earlier and that once we have op heavy operational concerns and uptime concerns, that it costs more. Uh, so there's another concern, which is this idea of the cost of not fixing a problem. So a lot of the time, you, you, you go to your change management board and they say, no, it's too dangerous. So the cost of leaving a vulnerability in production is another artifact of this security sandwich. So we need an alternative approach to this, do everything at the beginning, do everything at the end. And I, this one I am responsible for, and that is the security lasagna. And it could be the security stew, it could be the security goulash, security <laughs> strata, whatever your food of choice is. But the bottom line is that Security is considered an ongoing concern from the beginning of a project until a project is decommissioned, not until a project is stood up. And like any of these concerns, uh, the process will evolve, but it should be omnipresent, like this, more or less. And what does that look like? I mean, there are a lot of versions of that, and, and a lot of it depends on what your process as a whole is like. If you're a continuous delivery shop, the key integration points are going to be story generation uh, and various points within your delivery pipeline. If you're more waterfall, well, your work's going to be a little more difficult, but you really want checkpoints throughout the system and, and not gates. I want to separate this. The gate makes the anti-pattern, I think. You want, but you do want checkpoints. You don't want to forget about this concern. So application, uh, so despite the vagueness of this description, there's some common attributes to the pattern that should be consistent reg regardless of organizational structure. And, and it, it involves continually revisiting this concern throughout the SDLC and security decisions not being made in a vacuum either by operational security or by engineering or by business, and, uh, but rather with input from business stakeholders and with validation from engineering teams, QA, again, however your organization is structured. So there are a lot, I'd love to have a really concrete specific structure for you, but all your processes are so unique, you're going to have to create probably a snowflake process of your own, but try to, to get these ideas into it. So one, one of the, the ideas is what, where do you do these assertions? If you have, if, let's say you're in a continuous delivery pipeline, you're a real continuous or a continuous integration situation, and you, you want to know how you build these assertions. And you have a testing pyramid of some form. So where, do the, where does security fit in? I, I would suggest it fits in kind of like this. You've got your three tiers, and um, you're going to have to make similar choices. In some ways, the key to this is not thinking about it any differently than you think about other things, which is kind of weirdly ironic. Um, the, the rules of thumb are, are, are exactly the same in terms of evaluating payoff, in terms of resource utilization, time to test, fragility, like you would with any other test. You wouldn't want a, a unit test that takes three hours to run. Um, as with any other testing, you want to te push tests further down the pyramid or earlier in the pipeline, depending on how you're visualizing, if they tend to break a lot. So if you're noticing, boy, we sure are getting a lot of problems with this particular thing, and we're catching it way at the end in some end-to-end -end testing, try to find ways to push that further down so you're catching them faster. Now, how does this tend to break down? Well, the trick with security, particularly in this day and age, is there's a lot of integration points, usually. There's a lot of third-party tools, usually. And so you're going to be in a world of a lot of integration tests, most likely. And so the, one of the challenges you're going to have as an organization is trying to fit, call those integration tests, things where you integrate with your SSO, where you integrate with um, uh, VPCs, like if, you have, if you're up in Amazon and, and you want to make sure all your, all your routing is, is blocked correctly. And, um, uh, or if you have login UI, you're talking about full end-to-end -end testing. So, that will be the struggle, I can tell you, is trying to find the, the aspects of the functional test that you can isolate and push into unit tests and accept you're going to ha still have some functional tests in there. Um, that's, that's an inevitability. So that said, we're going to leave that pattern behind and move on to the next anti-pattern.
This, this, is, this is a pattern that only occurs once you've reached a certain level of organizational maturity, I think. So th there's phases in an organization. Phase one is security. That's what it's called. Second one is security doesn't really matter to us. No one cares about us. Third one is security does matter. I'll take it. And then the fourth is security is a process of risks and trade-offs. Let's think about it, which is where we want to arrive. Um, to mangle a quote by Bruce Schneier, security is not a process, is a process. I did just what you did yesterday. <laughs> security is a process, not a side order. So you can't just say, I'll have that with security. So the, there are conversations you've had like this, and I'll provide some color for those in the back. Please create feature X, Y, and Z and make them secure. You probably heard that before if, you're, if you have security um, even in the conversation. Yeah, do you want, let's talk about security. The answer is yes. That's, that's not a good answer. So unfortunately, this is not all the business owner's fault or problem. The response is often, we'll integrate our OAuth 2 based SSO using secure HTTP headers with SAML and blah, 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 blah. They're long gone. The business owner has checked out. They do not care anymore. Um, so there is a lot of pressure on these people not to be the next big target or whatever. CYA is also a big issue. They've said security, yes, and they consider that your problem now. Um, but development concerns, developers need to know how to, I won't use the word push back because I don't want, I, I think that sends the wrong message, but how to engage. And we tend to be really bad about that. We tend to talk, we jump to solutions. And the reason is just like it's easier for them to say security, yes or no, it's easier for us to dive into the world of tools and technologies long before solutions. And this is a particularly bad problem, I think, with large organizations who can afford to spend a million dollars on something that promises to be a silver bullet. They never are. So what you need is to have a conversation about this or you end up with that. Organizations spend enormous amounts of money to get very little. There's probably money that has to be spent, but we need to find ways to target where that money is spent. Otherwise, it's just lost revenue for dubious benefit. So how, how do we get better at this? I mean, I, I've told you the anti-pattern. The pattern is admittedly a little fuzzy because this is a really hard organizational problem, but I introduce the layer cake. So tiered security standards, and, and I, I can just see anyone at ThoughtWorks who hears the word standard, it like makes them crazy. They hate the word standard. So consider it more like advisory if you don't like standards. But it's not necessarily like a structured hierarchy. Um, there are places with huge compli compliance departments that have rules, but I've also worked at places with huge compliance departments where when I ask, what is our organizational standard for, let's say data at rest encryption, and they say encrypted, and that's not an answer. And um, so what, what, what do these provide? Why do you, why, the level of detail and level um, that, that th these rules, so to speak, need to be prescriptive will depend somewhat on your organization, its technical sophistication, its size, its level, security and compliance needs. Compliance is particularly sticky. At that point, you probably do just need rules. But for security, you want something a little like this. You wanna have, because th these things ultimately need to make it into code. And it is very easy for a developer to say, look at you in the face and say, but you didn't tell me that username password wasn't a valid login. So we want these to be reflected somewhere within our organizational structure. So an, uh, an application that's not, that is completely secu secure is an application that is not useful. A web application that, that is completely secure is one that doesn't exist. As you open ports, create endpoints, increasing access and reducing security, this is an inevitable and perfectly reasonable trade-off However, it is critical that the right compromises are made that enable the business functions with the minimum possible risk. And it is not reasonable in an organization of any size for a programmer to be making these decisions completely in a vacuum. Rather, these decisions must be made with people in the room who speak to the business needs so the right decisions are made. The result should be a three-tiered structure, maybe more, maybe less, uh, the rule of thumb. Um, a set of, or the, these organizational standards contain, th contain things like 
What's our baseline? This is again, back to this baseline notion. What's our baseline for how we secure a password anywhere within our organization? So then you don't have to write it in the stories or use cases or whatever, just what is the baseline? Um, what's our mitigation SLAs? This is another kind of pet peeve of mine that, that, that I, I, I played a role bridging the gap between security teams and development teams for a while. And a lot of the time, a tool would find a bug would find a, a vulnerability, and that vulnerability would be mission critical number one, whether it was a SQL injection that could drop all the tables in the entire system, or, an, or a reflected XSS, which could be mildly annoying. And so by having SLAs and saying, if this happens, this is the SLA. We need to finish this. We need to have this fixed within six hours. We need to have this fixed within a sprint. We need whatever, whatever is appropriate to your organization. Calling those out with room for with sufficient flexibility to be able to say, to have extenuating circumstance, I think is important. Um, that, and then security testing criteria. We expect, this is particularly important if you're dealing with third parties. If you're dealing with third parties, you wanna be able to say, we assume you have had a pen test, which is vague and possibly not helpful, but you do wanna be able to say something. We expect you have done some due diligence. Call that out. It doesn't hurt anyone to call that out. It may be obvious to you that they should do that. It is not necessarily gonna be obvious to them and it can be written into a contract, which is additional, additional benefit. Now beyond that, we have domain standards. So a lot of the standards that apply to the baseline have to be more restrictive or more specific as you get into a specific domain. For example, compliance obviously, as I mentioned before, but if I am dealing with say credit card data is the obvious one. If I am dealing with PII, user identifiable stuff, Suddenly the bar's a little higher and the rule set changes a little bit. Again, call those out as additional requirements because then when those stories come through the pipeline, you don't have to call them out specifically every single time that story comes. Then finally at the final tier, that's where something that doesn't fall within those categories, but you as a business owner, you as the collective decide there is a specific security interest here. Like this is particularly sensitive. We need two factor auth for it. That gets called out in the story. That gives, so, so, so there's this sort of, imagine this theoretical compression of these requirements that becomes the requirement for any given story. The implicit ones at the top two levels and the explicit ones at the last one. It just, it gives your QA something to know what to test for or your pen testers. It just, it, this, it states very clearly, hopefully reflecting business interests, what is important uh, for your security posture. And how you do this depends a little bit, again, on your organization. If you have a small organization, you can probably have those collective conversations about between technology and business, and if, if you're the same interest, company of one, great. You can just have two hats and sort of go back and forth. If you're a more, uh, a larger organization, you're probably more in this category, where you've got your technical concerns on one side, You've got your business concerns on the other in the nicer part of campus. And in the middle, you have people like business analysts who are sort of, depending on your perspective, either the translator or the wall between those two categories. One's good, one's a pathology. But those conversations, and again, if you're outsourcing, outsourcing, there's some very specific concerns at play. If you're outsourcing to a third party, this kind of structure is almost inevitable. You're gonna be talking to, I don't know, uh, probably a third party project manager and you need to be able to convey very specifically what the requirements are. Do not assume what they are. Um, by the way, this sort of middle translator role, I, I think of a BSA, something like that. There's a hundred names for this role, but they have a ch particularly challenging job because they have to be, be able to kind of talk in both, both worlds. So. That's my patterns. I just wanna mention very briefly um, before, before we're done, um, this. So this is, I, I would like to reserve a little bit of time to talk about ideas that are kind of way down there somewhere, or at least they seem that way to me, but there are ways we should, I think we should, be, we should start thinking about these problems. Um, because we're, like I said early on, we're, we're, we're fairly bad at it and uh, there's a lot of room for development, particularly in, 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 in um, my peers at ThoughtWorks talked about this yesterday, when the continuous delivery agile world meets security, 
it's like vinegar and water, right? Or oil and water is the expression right now. We're, we haven't figured out how this should work. I am of the mind. I have a blog called Continuous Security. And I have a, a, of the mind that eventually we will discover that this is a better approach, but we are not there yet. We have a lot to learn. So two ideas in my blue sky section. There's this HDD security. Those of you who are familiar with the idea of hypothesis-driven development, it's this idea of lots of little experiments rather than big bomb drop kind of deliveries. Um, it's a part of the lean movement and encourages delivery in small experiments rather than MVPs, which is sort of the, was the last incarnation. These small experiments provide insight. Uh, you need to know, uh, to help you know what to invest in um, and whether to pivot whether you're going in the right direction or whether you have to consider a subtle or a major change of direction. Now the challenge with application security is that we often face a large volume of risks and a very small likelihood but a very serious impact. And that, that makes this actually a pretty hard problem. And because it's so fragmented, it's hard to assess. And that doesn't mean it shouldn't be assessed or that it can't be assessed. It's that it's, it takes some creativity to do. And we need to find ways to get better at taking the data we do have to assess our risks uh, holistically. And so that the, when the CTO comes to us and says, so I've given you $2 million for security, and um, what have I gotten for it? And usually what we fall back into is sort of a fear, uncertainty, and doubt kind of thing. Like, oh my god, if you hadn't given me that $2 million, you have no idea what would have happened. We need to get away from that kind of thinking because it makes us look really like a uh, boy who cried wolf. and. Um, so, so figuring out what information we have about our attack surface is step one, and then trying to develop that information incrementally uh, is, I think, step two. So again, this is, this, is, this is blue sky land. You're not hearing a lot of, you hear security metrics, that term comes up, but when you dig into what that usually means, it's, it tends to be organizational maturity type stuff, which is not nothing, but it's, it's limited, let's put it that way. So um, the next one, oh, it just kicked me off. My little remote is gone. Luckily, it's not far. So this is the next one. I made it kind of scary, which is a shame, but it's not supposed to be. You know, the camera is watching you. So um, I want to encourage people to think of monitoring in a different way. We have a very, I think, at least I do generally, a very narrow vision of what monitoring is. We're usually thinking about either active or passive network monitoring, possibly some sort of web application firewall that's recording what's <laughs> happening. I think we have to think more organizationally when we think about monitoring. So to me, monitoring should include that stuff. You want, you want passive monitoring. You want possibly active monitoring. In addition, you should be aware of what's happening in your organization like you should be measuring um, what's the drag on your pipeline for security, your security tools. What, what's the impact those are having? Because if, they're, if it's too high, they're going to kick you out. Another thing you should be measuring, the effectiveness of your educational concerns, your educational efforts. This is a hard one. We're going through this right now, and we know this. But if you're going to spend a lot of money educating your developers on OWASP Top 10 or whatever, is it working? Finding ways to monitor that, I think, is an important next step, because you want to paint a large picture of what's happening in your enterprise, in your portfolio. And ultimately, um, you want to get to a point where some, some level of automation is possible. A lot of this is going to require human intervention. But you can get to the point where you know what your baselines are. Let's say you're using a tool like Akamai uh, out on the edge, which will, which will show you the, the rate of throughput. And you know that at a certain time of day, you get mm, throughput around let's say 100,000 hits an hour. And suddenly that end, end point gets 10 million hits an hour and then you had no sale, you had no, something happened. And those kinds of aberrational moments you want to detect not only at the network edge, not only internally, but at the organizational level. When did something happen we've never seen before? And at that point you're not going to automate uh, uh, mitigation, but it's going to tell the right people and um, I think it's Home Depot, was it the Home Depot attack? They learned that if nobody's listening to the alarms, you might as well just take out the batteries because they had all the alarms and nobody was listening. So 
Um, that's the blue sky section. Th ideas to think about, solutions I don't have, but I'm working on them and I will continue. So that's it. Um, I encourage you to check out those little code snippets, particularly those of you who sat in the back of the room. And um, if you have any questions, I'm gonna be here for a little while and thank you very much.